Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the case that we have for today is a solved one, but it's one that I've seen a lot of arguments for both sides. I thought this case was very interesting to look into and read all the court documents and all of that, so I'm really interested in hearing what your guys' thoughts are. But this is going to be a pretty hefty case with a lot of information, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Ryan Poston and Shayna Hubers. Ryan Carter Poston was born on December 30th, 1982, in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky to his parents, Lisa Carter and Jay Poston. He was the oldest child, having three younger sisters, Allison, Catherine, and Elizabeth. He was described as incredibly hardworking, intelligent, loving, caring, and he was very protective over his three little sisters, and he was very close with his family. He was also described as a very charming, good-looking man with a charismatic personality who did not have much trouble with the ladies. He was also part of a family who took education very seriously. He first attended the Blessed Sacrament School in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky before starting high school in the International School Manila in the Philippines before attending the International School of Geneva in Switzerland where he graduated from. I'm not exactly sure why he went international or why he switched schools or any of that, but it definitely seemed like he just had a passion for traveling and had the means to do so. After graduating from high school, Ryan went on to attend undergrad at the Indiana University where he had a triple major in history, geography, and political science. After graduating from IU, he attended law school at the Salmon P. Chase College of Law at Northern Kentucky in Highland Heights, Kentucky. After graduating from law school, he opened up his own law office and became a practicing attorney in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was sort of a family legacy to practice law in his family as his his grandfather and uncle were both practicing attorneys. In addition to being absolutely dedicated to his career and his education, Ryan was a very social and outgoing man. He loved spending time with friends at the bars and was not one to shy away from having a good time with his buddies. He also loved collecting guns, going to the shooting range to practice, and took a lot of pride in his collection. Now, in 2009, Ryan met a woman named Lauren Worley at a bar in Cincinnati and the two fell for each other very quickly. When they met, Lauren was studying at the Salmon P. Chase Law School, which is the same school that Ryan had graduated from. She was an absolutely beautiful young woman and they seemed to mesh very well together. They fell in love fast and by all accounts, Ryan was the perfect gentleman to her. He was always so polite and he made her feel very safe because of how skilled he was with his guns and he always carried a firearm in his ankle holster and that made her feel safe in case anything were to go wrong. The two quickly moved into an apartment together and even adopted two puppies together, Lily and Max. They really did seem like they would make it last and go the distance together and get married. However, after a year and a half of what felt like the perfect romance, the two actually split up. They were both absolutely head over heels for one another, but they were both just so young. Lauren was trying to work as hard as possible to finish her law education, and let me tell you, being in a relationship in any sort of grad school is really difficult. Plus, Ryan was constantly working, so they thought that it was best if they just went their separate ways for a while, but in the back of their heads, they always knew that they were going to end up back together sometime. Day. Now, like I said earlier, 28-year-old Ryan was an attractive man who did not have problems with girls. So in 2011, he met another beautiful young woman. Now, his cousin Carissa was actually the one who introduced Ryan to a friend named Shayna Hubers. Now, Shayna was 19 years old at the time and was a student at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, around 80 miles from where Ryan lived in Highland Heights. She was studying psychology at the time and she too was very dedicated to her studies. She was bright, beautiful, and charismatic. The two met through Facebook and they immediately hit it off. They went on their first date on April 8th, 2011, Shayna's 20th birthday, and they started dating shortly after. So now let's talk a little bit about Shayna Hubers. Shayna Hubers was born on April 8th, 1991 in Lexington, Kentucky. She was described by those around her as very type A to the point of being a perfectionist who absolutely needed to do well and exceed at everything she tried. She loved theater and drama and loved loved being in the spotlight and the center of attention. She was a very intelligent and gifted student, earning several awards for her academic excellence and leadership, but she struggled when it came to maintaining friendships and relationships. One of Shayna's friends said that Shayna loved drama on and off the stage. 
if a guy she was talking to broke up with her or said that he wasn't interested, she would take it incredibly hard. She would sob and cry and sometimes just scream and she could not let anything go. Like I said, she was studying psychology at the University of Kentucky, but then she went on to pursue her master's degree in school counseling. So again, she worked very, very hard to achieve her goals and was well on her way to becoming very successful in her life. So like I said, Ryan and Shayna began dating shortly after meeting. However, Ryan quickly realized that maybe him and Shayna just were not right for each other. They were very on again, off again throughout their entire relationship, which we will get more into in just a minute, but it seemed like Ryan was always trying to pull away and when he did, Shayna would do everything that she could to try and pull him back in. She was very interested in having a long-term serious relationship while Ryan was just looking for more of a casual relationship for fun. He didn't take life or the relationship too seriously, so naturally him and Shayna just didn't want the same things from a relationship. However, like I said, the more Ryan would pull away and try to get out of the relationship, it seemed like Shayna just got more and more obsessive and desperate to save the relationship. A friend of Ryan said that when Shayna would meet up with Ryan's friends, she was very, very cold towards them, especially the girls, but they could tell that she was absolutely obsessed with Ryan. It seemed like her goal from the very beginning was to make him settle down with her and only pay attention to her rather than his friends, but when that wasn't happening, she didn't know how to take it and it became a huge issue for her. He was very busy with work and he didn't have the time to deal with all of these issues in a relationship. He tried to explain to Shayna that she needed a lot more than what he could give her and that she would just be better off with someone else, but she just would not take no for for an answer, she would text him upwards of a hundred times before he would even respond once. She would go on his Facebook and block any women that he was friends with. She would just start showing up uninvited to wherever Ryan would go and sometimes if he was out, she would look all dressed up and pretty, acting as if she was invited and like everything was normal, trying to impress him and whoever he was with as much as possible. There were other times that she would show up to his condo unannounced and would refuse to leave. Things started getting pretty bad. But even through all of this, Ryan could just not seem to let Shayna go for good. He would tell his friends that she was just a psycho and wouldn't leave him alone, yet he said that he couldn't leave her because he was afraid that he would hurt her feelings. He said that he really just didn't know what to do or how to act in this situation. The two maintained this extremely volatile roller coaster of a relationship on and off for almost a year and a half. But throughout this entire relationship, both Shayna and Ryan would text their friends about everything everything that was going on. On one occasion, Shayna texted a friend, quote, he says he's only with me because I make him feel so awful about it when I cry, because again, he said that he didn't want to hurt Shayna's feelings, so he simply didn't know what to do. Then, at the same time, Ryan was texting his friends about what was going on with Shayna. He wrote to his cousin, this is getting to be restraining order level crazy. She's shown up to my condo like three times and refuses to leave each time. Then, to another friend on Facebook, he said, literally, probably the craziest effing person I've ever met. She almost scares me. And to this day, this friend said that he should have told Ryan to walk away at that point, but he didn't. So this is when we get into what each side says about the two's relationship. Up to this point, it definitely seems very one-sided. Like Ryan is just trying to pull away while Shayna is just relentlessly obsessed with Ryan and will not take no for an answer. However, friends of Shayna say that he was playing mind games with her and he was being very mentally abusive. Friends of Shayna claimed that she would always just talk about how much she loved Ryan, how she would always pick up around his condo, do his laundry for him, take his dogs out, and would go out and get him dinner and bring it back to him, basically did pretty much everything for him. While according to this friend, Ryan would just always make comments saying that Shayna needed a boob job or a facelift, saying that she needed to lose weight, because she was fat. But then on the other side, Ryan's friends claim that this was not true. One friend said that in his 10 years of knowing Ryan, not once has he said anything like that to a woman. And the reason I brought up Lauren Worley from earlier is because she also says that throughout their entire relationship, he would never treat her like that. His friends would say that he's just a super sweet, nerdy guy who never wanted to hurt anyone. But 
despite which side of the story you choose to believe. It was clear that this was an incredibly hostile and volatile relationship and it was not good for either of them. By October of 2012, the relationship escalated even more than anyone could have imagined. Now, in October of 2012, Ryan had invited Shayna over to eat dinner with his family. After the dinner, the two went back to Ryan's condo to spend the night. However, at around 3 a.m. on October 13th, so the next day in 2012, Shayna woke up in the middle of the night and called her mom and asked her to come get her because she wasn't feeling good. So Shayna's mom drove the 80 miles to Ryan's condo to pick up Shayna to try and make her feel better. The two hung out at his condo for a little bit and Shayna's mother tried to comfort her and make her feel better. Then later that morning, the two left Ryan's condo. Then later that same day, Shayna had texted Ryan saying that she was having chest pains, heart palpitations, radiating arm pain, and saying that her mom was driving her to the hospital. She told him that she got an EKG done and was on her way to seeing a heart specialist who prescribed her different medications to help her with her condition. However, this actually never happened. She was with her mother that day, but the two were having a completely normal afternoon together, shopping and getting lunch together. Turns out she was doing research on her phone about blood pressure and heart problems, while simultaneously texting Ryan about the problems that she was having. One search she did was for left ventricular hypertrophy and then sent messages to Ryan right after naming all the medications for that condition, saying that she was prescribed those medications. Now, that same weekend, Ryan tried to make it very clear to Shayna that he was not able to see her for the whole weekend, but he didn't give her a solid reason why. Turns out though, this was because he actually had a date with an absolutely beautiful woman named Audrey Bolt, who was actually Miss Ohio USA in 2012. Of course, he didn't tell Shayna about this and was hoping that she wouldn't find out. Now, Ryan also met Audrey through Facebook through a friend who was also a beauty pageant contestant. The two had friended each other on Facebook in January of 2012, but the first time they actually spoke was in October after Ryan had left a funny and interesting comment on one of her posts where she was asking for movie reviews. The friend of Audrey said that she was very bubbly and personable and was a perfect match for Ryan. Audrey thought that Ryan was funny and smart and said that they always had some very funny and lighthearted conversations. And Ryan was very excited to meet up and go on this date with her. The two had been texting each other back and forth that entire day and he expressed to her how excited he was for their date. So he texted her that the two would meet for their date at around 9.30 or 10 at a bar that night. Now, initially Ryan planned on going straight to the bar from work to meet her, but they apparently decided on meeting up at this low-key dive bar. So he asked her if he should go home first to change out of a suit and she said yes he should change however Ryan never ended up showing up to his date. This is because Shayna showed up to Ryan's condo unannounced without warning. It was at this point that 911 received a phone call from Shayna admitting that she had just shot and killed her boyfriend in self-defense. She said that she shot him in self-defense after they had an argument where he ended up beating her and then carried her outside of the condo. She tried to come back in to get her stuff and saw that he had a gun, so she grabbed it from his hands and shot him. She then admitted to shooting him several times more because he was twitching and she didn't want to sit there and watch him twitching. Kevin County 911. Ma'am, I have, I have an, an um, um, oh, I, I killed my boyfriend in self-defense. Okay, where are you at? I'm at 12 Meadow Lane, Highland Heights, Kentucky. 1076. Okay, 12 Meadow Lane, are you in a house or an apartment there? It's an apartment, it's apartment suite 10. Is it Meadow, anything else, Meadow View or something? No, 12 Meadow Lane, me and my children are so okay, 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 tell me again, tell me again what unit you're in, it's not showing on my computer. Okay, you're at 12 Meadow Lane, unit number 10. Okay, hold on, hold on. What did you kill him with? A gun, a loaded gun in the house. Tell me where the gun is right now. A gun is in the house. Where at though, ma'am? Tell me where it's at. I, I laid it on the bookshelf. Where at? Lay it on a shelf? On the bookshelf. It's, it's where are you? I'm standing about 10 feet from his dead body. Okay, are you sure that he is dead? He's, he's dead, ma'am. He's completely dead. Okay. And how long ago did you shoot him? I don't know, 15, 10 minutes, not even that long. Like 10 or 15 minutes ago? Yeah. 
Okay, what's your name? My name is Shana Michelle Huber. I'm sorry, what is it again? Tell me. Shana, Shana Michelle Huber. Huber? Huber, H-U-B-E-R-S, Huber. Okay, well, so what's your name again? Shana or Shana? Shana, S-H-A-Y-N-A. All right, Shana, I'm just having a hard time hearing you. Okay, all right. Now, you're going to stay on the line. Listen, you're going to stay on the line with me, okay, because this is what we're going to do. The officers are going to want me to stay on the line with you, so when you get when they get there, they're going to want to know where that gun is, and we want you to get out safe too, okay? Okay, are they going to arrest me? Uh, Ma'am, I don't know what they'll do. We're going to send send them out. I'm going to stay on line with you, okay? I mean, I'm not a murderer, ma'am. I just killed him. So what, well, what happened exactly? What happened? He, he beat me and turned me out of the house. He, he did? He tried to beat me and tried to carry me out of the house, and I came back in to get my things, and he was right in front of me, and he reached down and grabbed the gun, and I grabbed it out of his hand and told him. All right. Do you need an ambulance? Have you been injured? I'm not injured, ma'am. I was thrown into the side of the couch. Okay. And how old is he? He's 29. He'll be 30 on. He would have been 30 on December the 30th. All right. What's his name? Ryan Carter Poston. He's an attorney in Cincinnati. Okay. Have you had a history of domestic violence with him? Yes. Okay. And is this your gun? No, this is his gun. He keeps loaded guns in the house. So he, he he's not slammed you into the gun. couch, but you don't have any injuries? I don't have any injuries. I was just very frightened. He's, he picked, he's a lot bigger than me. He's 6'3", 200 pounds. I'm 5'8", 120. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he picked me up and, and was carrying me out of the house. And I said, let me get my things at least if we're going to break up. And, and he wouldn't let me get my things. And when I reached around to try to get my things, he... I can hear myself echoing in the background, ma'am. It, it's just this phone system. This phone system has got a delay. And he he pushed me down from, from the door all the way to the couch. And when they come here, they'll see how far that is. He threw me across the room. And, <laughs> and I was very startled. I was laying on the floor. Okay. And I killed him. Okay. Right, Ma'am, this is what I want you to do, though. Can you, you're sure he's not, ma'am, you're sure he's not breathing at all? No, that's okay. They actually have someone that's outside almost right now, but I'm gonna stay on the line with you, okay? When they when they tell me to what we're go well, when they tell me to what I'm gonna tell you to do is walk to the door with your hands up because we want you to come out safely, okay? So that's why I'm staying on the line with you, ma'am. I don't. I'm just a dispatcher. I'm nothing but a dispatcher, so I can't tell you. My job is to keep you on line, make sure my officers get there safely, and nothing happens to them, okay? Okay. Is he out front? 
ma'am, what I want you to do is I want you to set yeah. the phone down, but I do not want you to hang it up. I want you to go to your front door. I want you to open it up, walk outside the door with your hands in front of you. It's okay, I will. And your hands open. The officers are at okay. the top of the steps, but set the phone okay. down. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay, I set the phone down. Set the phone down and put your hands in front of you. Are you there? Are you there? I'm here. I set the phone down. I walk out the front door with my hands and palms down. I went, yes, with your hands open and you're in, straight in front of you. Officers are at okay. the top of the steps. Okay, okay, bye. So it's not completely clear exactly what happened. It seems obvious that she showed up to the apartment uninvited and the two had an argument, but we don't really know if she knew about Ryan's date with Audrey. She said in the phone call that he was breaking up with her and that's why she went in to just go get her things. So I assume that there's probably some truth to this, that he probably did want to break up with her before going on this date and that is when things escalated. So after police arrived on scene, they saw Ryan's body laying on the dining room floor behind the dining room table. They took Shayna in for questioning and that is when things get very strange. So so when she initially got into the interrogation room, it started off as the normal type of thing. You know, they asked her if she wanted a cigarette, if she smokes, things like that to calm her down and get her ready to talk. But then immediately she started crying and wailing and making all sorts of noises. So the officer, Lieutenant Fortnash, told her that she'll be okay and that he'll be with her in just a minute. Then he walked out of the interrogation room and according to him, the second he did this, she just stopped crying like a light switch. When he came back into the room, he read her her Miranda rights and she immediately requested an attorney so Lieutenant Fortnash was not able to question her at all. He was not allowed to ask her a single question. However, despite this, Shayna just kept talking. She talked all about her history of abuse that she faced at the hands of Ryan and she described how this whole situation went down. She pretty much reenacted how she shot Ryan, how he fell, and the entire situation surrounding that. She was asking questions like, what do they do with murderers in jail? Do they get to shower or do they just stay dirty? She talked about how Ryan just called her a hillbilly from Kentucky and she's like, yeah, I am. Then she talked about how conceited he was and how he wanted a nose job and she said, I guess I gave him the nose job he always wanted. Then, once Detective left the room, she started singing Amazing Grace and pacing around the room and said to herself, I did it. Yes, I did. I can't believe I did that. All of that while she had a little bit of a smirk on her face. She talked as if she was just telling a story right after she shot and killed the guy who she claimed to love. It was just so strange and unbelievable. And may I remind you, she was not being questioned at all. She talked at investigators for three hours straight and one even said that she was talking so much that police didn't even want to be in the same room with her because she was that annoying. He had put his arm across the table and there's a lamp and he had put his arm across the table and had it in my face and was screaming at me at the top of his lungs after he had thrown me around the room and was saying emotionally to me, you're a f***ing hillbilly. I I hate you. I hate everything about you for what you are and my family. And he was screaming it and he was he had his hand on the table and he wasn't completely standing up. He was like this. So like this. He was sitting he was announced it when I shot him. He was went like this. Literally. That's when I knew he was dead. Or close to it mm -hmm. and twitching. And that's and I couldn't I let him I still even though the hurt I still enough of me loved him that I couldn't stand to watch him twitch I knew he was gonna die or have a completely deformed face. He's very vain. One of our last conversations we had that was good was that he wants my best friend who's a dentist to do his veneers and wants to get a nose job. Just that kind of person. And I shot him right here. I gave him his nose job. He wanted I broke it and I just picked up the gun and in the middle of him doing something with his arm or saying something crazy, shot him. And I thought, oh my God, 
up whenever I died, you know. And he was laying with his face on the table, like twitching. And so I knew he was going to die a very slow and painful death. I knew he was already dead, you know, and within the next 20 seconds, within the next two minutes, I knew he was going to be dead. And he was in a lot of pain. He was twitching, he was moaning, but he was ultimately dead. And so I shot him enough times to kill him so that he wouldn't suffer at that point, which was a few more times. And he, I shot him, I think I shot him twice, thought he was completely dead and he was laying there still twitching and making noises. And I shot him in the head. I probably should have left it there, but I knew he was going to die. Mm -hmm. Or have a very deformed face. And you were concerned. And I knew, oh no, he would have died. He was already dying. He was already, he was dying. But I just walked around the table and shot him where I knew he would die immediately. It's fast. His obsession with guns killed him. You know, I would have never, I'm so Democrat, I would have never touched a gun in my life until I dated him. And you know, I wasn't doing anything that was mean. I was like begging him to, to stay in the relationship and be with me because I knew that we weren't really loving each other. You know, Ryan had told me that he loved me and wanted to be with me. And I guess somewhere along the way, that grew to hate. He was screaming how much he hated me. I don't know if anyone will ever want to marry me if they know that I killed a boyfriend and helped. <laughs> Not funny, but the stuff he was saying to me was so abusive while he was throwing me around the room. I think in the midst of that, my love turned to hate. I remember screaming, Reaching up to grab the shirt. You out there. You mock my family out there. Talk back. Please, please, think really of my mother and my family.
sounds like in high school and she was a convicted felon. She told me that the women that she got, she was she went for cocaine. She told me that the women that she got along with in jail or prison were the women that were there because they had killed her husband and said that hell has no fury like a woman's for. <laughs> So, of course, she was indicted for murder on December 20th, 2012, and on January 16th, 2013, she entered a not guilty plea for these charges. Then, by April 13th, 2015, two and a half years after the incident took place, the trial began. The prosecutors argued that Shayna showed up unexpectedly that night and shot and killed Ryan while he tried to break up with her for good. As we know from before, Ryan does carry a firearm and he has them all around his condo, so it's thought that when Ryan got home to change, he set down the gun that he normally carried down on the kitchen table. Then after Shayna showed up, maybe he brought up breaking up with her. I don't really know how that situation happened, but of course they started arguing. And at some point they say that she found out about his plans to go on a date with another woman. And that's when she spotted the gun on the table, picked it up and shot him. And this is the argument all according to the prosecutors. Then on the other hand, the defense said that Shayna shot and killed Ryan as an act of self-defense since she was the victim of long-term domestic abuse. Now, now, Shayna actually had two trials for the murder, one in 2012 and one in 2019. They had a retrial because one of the jurors was actually a convicted felon and they were not allowed to be on the jury. There was a lot of information that was the same in both trials. There were a few things that were brought up in the second trial, which I will also discuss, but since a lot of it is pretty much the same, I'm not going to go into both trials, that would just be very repetitive. So I'm going to talk about the evidence from both trials just all at once since both trials did have the same outcome. So first, let's talk about the scene. So Shayna ended up shooting Ryan a total of six times. A forensic pathologist testified that the first time Shayna shot Ryan was to his head, which would have debilitated him. The next five shots were fired as Shayna was walking towards him, which is contrary to what Shayna said, which was that she was firing them as Ryan was charging at her. He fell on the floor after the first three shots were fired, leaving him unable to move and completely defenseless, but was still alive even after all six shots were fired. Then, Shayna claimed that Ryan threw her into the TV at his condo. However, at the scene, they found that the TV was still in the exact place that it should be and that it was still dusty from not having been cleaned or moved in many weeks or months. Shayna also claimed that Ryan reached across the table to grab the gun and that there was some sort of struggle and that he threw her across across the table. Now, there were items all over the kitchen table, but they were standing upright and were not tossed around like you'd expect if she was thrown on the table, which indicated that he hadn't reached across the table or threw her on the table. His apartment was pretty messy, but his father testified that he was a bit of a slob, so that wasn't out of the ordinary for things to be disorganized around the apartment. Because of all of this, the scene did not indicate any signs of a struggle. Next, the prosecution called two witnesses to testify about what they heard that night night. The two witnesses live directly below Ryan in the condo. They said that they heard two shots in quick succession, followed by four more rapid fire shots. The witness said that she did not hear any yelling, screaming, thumping, stomping, or any other moving around before these shots were fired. So again, that indicated that Ryan did not toss around Shayna like she claimed. Then, the prosecutors questioned the timing of the 911 call that she made after shooting Ryan. Turns out, before calling 911, Shayna actually called her mother first. It wasn't until about 15 minutes after the shooting that she actually called 911. This indicated that she probably did not think that her life was in danger because she would have probably called them a lot sooner if she was afraid that he was attacking her and was going to kill her. So, from all of this, they had to question, if this truly was in self-defense, why did she continue shooting him so many more times, even after he was rendered defenseless after the first few shots? Why was his messy apartment so in place if she was fighting him so hard? Plus, why wasn't she injured at all? She didn't have a single scratch to her. She even told the dispatcher on the 911 call that she wasn't injured, but you'd think that if she feared for her life, he must have done something pretty bad to her and beaten her up pretty bad. Now, you don't have to have a black eye or really 
bad gashes to be in fear for your life. But she herself said that he was tossing her around, was throwing her, slamming things on her, and was beating her up. So by her own admission, she should have had several injuries. Then why didn't the neighbors hear any of the tossing around or struggle or thumping around like she claimed? And why did she take so long to make this 911 call again if she was truly in fear of her life? The next part of the trial revolved more about the couple's relationship, so things that happened before the night of the shooting. So like I described earlier, throughout their entire 18-month relationship, the two had broken up a few times. At one point, she had confronted him about things that he had apparently said to others about her. According to Shayna, after she confronted him about all of the awful things that he said about her, he picked her up and physically threw her out of his condo and then as she was trying to come back in to get all of her things he slammed the door on her repeatedly then the couple took a few months of a break between april and july of 2012. once they started seeing each other again in that july shana says that ryan placed a lot of different conditions on their relationship these conditions included requiring her to speak less to have a hobby at his condo so that she wasn't bothering him all the time and said that she had to participate in sexual acts with other women. She said that Ryan would degrade her and make fun of her whenever he got the chance. She said that she was emotionally and physically harassed and abused by him, and she said that he made her feel completely worthless. However, on the other side, Ryan's receptionist and legal assistant testified that she witnessed Shayna's obsessive behavior and said that it just took a toll on him. She said that she would see her texting him 50 to 100 times per day while he was at work. She would show up to the office unannounced. If she couldn't get a hold of him on his personal phone, she would call him at work and ask for him. The receptionist said that it was absolutely relentless and it took such a toll on him that he just gave up and would be like, okay, Shayna, whatever you want, because it was easier than just trying to break it off with her like he had tried so many times. She said that even when he told her, the receptionist, about his date with Miss Ohio, she was immediately worried. She warned him to be firm with Shayna, to change the locks on his door, to make sure that she wasn't going to show up because this receptionist said that she knew Shayna was a stalker. And when she said all of these things to Ryan, he just smiled to her and said, don't worry, I got this. Also, throughout the relationship, there were thousands and thousands of texts sent between Ryan and Shayna, most of them coming from Shayna and Ryan only responding rarely. There were also many text messages between them and their respective friends to show a story of how each of them felt throughout the entire relationship. Now, we saw some of these texts earlier, but this goes into a little bit more detail. And I also want to mention that it might be a little bit confusing because this timeline does jump around a little bit because I went in sections of how the evidence was presented rather than a chronological timeline. So if this is confusing to you, I'm sorry, but this section is focusing on the text messages that were sent. In February of 2012, before their initial break, he texted Shayna, you can tell people that you broke up with me, to which he replied in part, I love you dearly, far more than you deserve. Then by March, he pleaded with Shayna, writing, Shayna, stop texting me, and in all caps, I no longer have the patience to deal with you. Then in April, Ryan texted his cousin. She came to my place on Sunday morning, and I literally had to pick her up and throw her into the hall. Then they had their break from April to July. Ryan had actually blocked Shayna's number, but Shayna got a new number and called him at first pretending to be a client, and that is when they ended up getting back together. However, by August, the relationship was going south once again. Ryan texted Shayna, I'm turning off my phone and padlocking the door, to which Shayna sent a hundred messages and Ryan texted back, I'm not reading any of these, stop. So after this, apparently Shayna showed up to Ryan's condo with her own key that he never gave her and he would not leave. So Ryan went over to sleep at his father's house because she just would not leave. So then in one message that Shayna sent to a friend 11 days before the incident, she said, when I go to the shooting range with Ryan tonight, I want to turn around, shoot and kill him and play it like it's an accident with other messages to this friend saying things like I hate him and that their love has turned to hate. She had also sent a message to another friend who was a practicing dentist and said that Ryan's been begging me to ask you to do his veneers, but please F them up and make him ugly so he'll never get another girl. I hate him. Additionally, in October of 2012, Ryan received messages from an unknown cell phone number initially pretending to be a potential client 
mind, but then would send messages saying some pretty insulting things. They said things like, lose your beer gut and get better at your job, and then said other things about how he sucked at his job and things like that. Turns out the number actually belonged to Shayna's roommate, and Shayna had screenshots of this conversation on her phone and sent these screenshots to another friend in a text saying, I texted Ryan this from my roommate's phone. So this just kind of shows how tumultuous the relationship was over text messages that they had sent. There are so many more texts, but obviously I cannot read you all the thousands of texts that were recovered, but this does give a pretty good idea of the things that they were going through. Other testimony came out about Shayna's behaviors before the shooting. Turns out Shayna probably did know about Audrey because she had friended her on Facebook just two days before the shooting. Then of course, at the trial, they also played these videos of Shayna talking and talking and talking during the interrogation. Obviously, she had said some pretty damning things like saying that he was evil and he deserved it. Her behaviors during these videos and during the trial were all very bizarre and she showed absolutely no remorse for what she had done. So that is all the information that's kind of piling up against Shayna. But then on the other hand, they also read messages that Ryan had sent to some friends that showed that he also was not in a very good mental space and was also very angry and said some pretty violent things. He was very upset about things that were happening with his job and said some very violent and questionable things. To one friend in August, he was talking about being sued by his law partner who he had a recent falling out with and said, I wanna rig explosives to everything I see. Then on October 4th, he said, there's nothing more that I want than to just scorch the effing earth and leave this entire city in a burnt pile of rubble. So the defense argued that he was a man who was consumed in deep rage against the world and had a lot of hatred building up. That with the fact that Shannon claim that he was physically abusive could show that maybe he did snap and do something to hurt her that made her have to defend herself. However, the prosecution argued that there's no indication in any of these messages that any of his anger was directed at Shayna or anyone else. It was obvious that he was very frustrated and angry and was probably in a very dark place, but it does not prove that any of this was directed at Shayna. I'm sure we've all said some very intense things when we're angry or upset, maybe not quite to this extent, but being sued is a pretty huge deal and with everything else that he has going on with Shayna, it makes sense why he may not be in a very good headspace. But again, I will concede that no, most of us don't say things quite to this extent and it does show that he was in a dark place and just because none of this anger in these messages were directed at Shayna herself, it doesn't mean that him being generally angry could have caused him to snap. Also, the defense claimed that Ryan was abusing drugs at the time of the shooting. Shayna testified that he was always whacked out on drugs. She said that at the beginning of their relationship, he kept an Altoid box full of Xanax. It had also been discovered in his toxicology report that he had been using drugs like Ambien and Adderall. They found that he had filled a prescription for Adderall that was 90 pills about 24 hours before his death, but found only 77 pills in the bottle, which was sitting on the kitchen table at his condo. Then, according to a urine sample, it was found that he had been using drugs like cocaine and marijuana. According to Shayna, Ryan's cousin had told her that he was a really nice guy when he wasn't on drugs. Then in a message he sent to a friend via Facebook, he said, I've noticed that the only times that I enter into relationships is when I'm on antidepressants and then when I'm off of them, even if I'm in the middle of the relationship, I will soon change my mind about wanting to be in the relationship. Shayna also said that he suffered from very severe withdrawal at the end of the days when he would take Adderall. He would tell her that he can't talk on the phone or talk to her at all at the end of the day due to how lousy he felt. So they argued that these drugs could have caused him to act out of character and then snap and attack Shayna. They also argued that maybe his history of drug use could have also played into Shayna's perception of Ryan and caused her to fear him. The defense also pointed to the fact that Shayna had never done anything like this before. She had absolutely no criminal history and zero history of violence. Then they added to the argument that she'd been physically abused throughout the entire relationship, so she feared for her life. Next, a psychiatrist took the stand to talk about Shayna's mental health. Shayna had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and PTSD stemming from abuse that she faced in her childhood. So Shayna testified that when she was five years old, she was molested by a slightly older female friend in her mother's closet. Then she says when she was 16 years old, she was shoved into a bathroom stall at a high school football game and was sexually abused. She also said that while she was growing up, her father would often touch her breasts. Now, this psychiatrist said that he did talk to Shayna's parents and of course they denied all accusations, but he also said that he examined Shayna's father and it was very clear that 
that he was a very mentally ill man. So now connecting this back to Ryan, Shayna said that when she told Ryan about all of the abuse, he acted completely indifferent to it and acted like he didn't care. She also testified about how Ryan would pressure her to take part in sexual acts that she did not want to partake in. As we learned from before, once they got back together, Shayna claimed that he would pressure her into doing sexual acts with other girls. She also said that Ryan was very unhappy with their sexual relationship because he wanted her to lose weight and get a boob job. Then, in addition to this, she said that she could not find pleasure in their sexual relationship. She even got an injection that would increase the amount of pleasure that she felt, but Ryan still was not happy with their sexual relationship. She said that he did not understand what she had been through, all the abuse that she went through, and that she physically could not feel the same pleasure as other people due to the abuse that she suffered, and Ryan was very unhappy about that. So the defense argued that due to the abuse that she had suffered, she had no foundation for what was okay in a relationship and what wasn't. She truly did not know how to act in a relationship, so in addition to how badly he allegedly treated her, she was in a pretty horrible situation mentally and physically. Additionally, a neighbor testified that one time, Shayna showed up on her doorstep crying with an obvious red hand mark on her arm. Shayna had told this neighbor that Ryan had just thrown her down the hallway. So this shows that there was evidence of at least one time where she may have been physically abused by Ryan. But then on the other hand, I think it was the same neighbor, I'm not exactly sure if it was the same neighbor or a different neighbor, but a neighbor testified that Shayna would often text her asking her if Ryan was home when she was out of town. She would text the neighbor saying that she wanted to make sure that Ryan wasn't at the bar and wasn't cheating on her, but then in one text she said, he's such a loser, I swear to God he doesn't even have a job, lol. Another witness claimed that Shayna was actually the one who was always begging Ryan to have sexual relations, so that could indicate that maybe she she could have been making up these other things or was just using it as an excuse. Now, I will note that I don't know if any of this other physical abuse at the hands of her friend or um, at the high school or at the hands of her parents has ever been confirmed or not, or if it was just testified by her. So it's hard to know whether this was true or if she was making it up for sympathy points or if they were just trying to create a more convincing story as to what was going on in the relationship. At the end of the trial, the defense argued that Shayna had suffered from domestic abuse and battered wife syndrome, while the prosecution said that there was no evidence that this was in self-defense. So after both sides rested in the first trial on April 23rd, 2015, after five hours of jury deliberation, Shayna was found guilty of the murder of Ryan Poston and was sentenced to 40 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 20. Now, after being sentenced and spending some time in jail, she actually met a transgendered woman named Unique Taylor, who she had started a relationship and eventually went on to get married to. Unique was in jail for robbery and for being a a frequent felony offender. They sent in a marriage request that was granted on June 7th, 2018, and the two were married. However, Unique was eventually released, and the two are now divorced due to irreconcilable differences according to their divorce papers. So, like I said at the beginning of the video, Shayna did appeal her first conviction because her lawyer found out that one of the jurors was a convicted felon, and in Kentucky, felons are not allowed to serve on juries. So, Shayna's new trial took place on August 8th, 2018, after getting a new out-of-state lawyer. The second trial did focus a lot more on the sexual nature of their relationship that I described before, whereas the first trial had a little bit less of that as an aspect to their relationship. Shayna was hopeful that this new trial would have a different result and that she could hopefully prove that she was in fact a victim of domestic abuse. However, once again, she was found guilty of Ryan's murder and was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After the verdict and the sentencing was read, apparently Shayna showed absolutely no emotion. She will be up for parole in 2032, so 12 years from now. After the sentencing, the defense asked for a reduced of 20 years, saying Shayna could be rehabilitated and could become a productive member of society. They say her behavior was mitigated by immaturity and psychological disorder, but the prosecution scoffed at that and said that her admission of shooting him four extra times shows that this was an execution and she treated him like roadkill. The family also came out and said how disgusted they were at the court and how the media handled their death. They said that they were watching TV one time and they just saw a flash of Ryan's dead body laying on the floor. And if you look up crime scene photos, they are online as well, showing Ryan's dead body and everything. Obviously, I didn't include them in this video because that's totally inappropriate. I obviously did put some crime scene photos in this video, but not the ones that showed Ryan's dead body 
but the fact that these TV shows are broadcasting their son's dead body is just despicable. So that's pretty much where the case sits today. She is sitting at the Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women, and as far as I've seen, she has maintained that she did this out of self-defense. But that's where the whole question comes in of whether we think this is true or not, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys think about this case. As for me, in pretty much any case, I can always see both sides, and it's no different for this case. I can definitely see both sides of the argument. I can definitely see how Ryan could not have been the nicest or the most supportive boyfriend. The one argument that did bug me a lot about this trial was people saying, well, if he treated her so bad, why did she keep coming back? At one point, they said it was impossible for her to have battered wife syndrome because she didn't live with him and there was always an out for her. And that is true. She didn't live with him. She didn't have anything actually writing on this relationship like money or housing or kids or anything else like that. But I can definitely see how he could have made her feel so small and so low that she was just so desperate for his attention that she just kept coming back. Being treated badly and then going back to the person that treated you badly doesn't mean that they didn't treat you badly in the first place. One thing that I think is very clear that we've seen throughout the entire trial is that no matter how much Ryan tried to pull away for so many months, he kept going back to her. So I can definitely see how that can be very confusing and frustrating for her. But then obviously on the other side, she had her own issues that she had to deal with. She was very clearly the personality type where she would start obsessing over someone and just could not handle the thought of not having him. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and one of the hallmarks of that disorder is having trouble with relationships and attaching themselves to one person and finding it very, very difficult to let go. A lot of times they form very inappropriate relationships. In my psychology class, they came with an example of a girl that my teacher knew. She was in this professor's class and she became obsessed with the professor and would text him and you know, this relationship got very inappropriate over what their actual relationship should have been, but even though she knew that it wasn't right, and even though she knew that this was her teacher, she could not let him go. He tried to pull away, he tried to explain to her that this was not proper for a teacher and a student, but she just could not let him go. And I'm not trying to generalize everyone with BPD at all, but this is a very common thing that we see in this disorder. So I think this plays a huge factor into why Shayna just could not let him go. And again, especially having this disorder, I can see how it can be very confusing and frustrating that one moment he's saying he doesn't want her anymore, making her feel really horrible and awful. And then the next minute he was probably a normal boyfriend being really nice to her. But obviously I think there are a lot of things that she could have done to help herself through this. I hope she's getting help in the jail to help her, you know, know how to form relationships and stop becoming obsessed with people in her life because that's just not healthy. Obviously you can't use mental health as an excuse to do horrible, horrible things things like this, and that's not what I'm doing at all, but I do see where this whole thing came from. I do see where it stemmed, and obviously I am not victim blaming. I'm not saying that it's Ryan's fault whatsoever. I think this is absolutely tragic that this happened to Ryan, but I do think that she had issues that she needed to deal with. Again, Ryan lost his life. He's the victim. He didn't do anything wrong in terms of deserving to be shot and killed. And obviously she was very, very difficult to deal with. I can see why he kept coming back. I can see why he found it very difficult to let her go because the second he would try to break up with her, she would freak out and wouldn't leave him alone. He tried blocking her number and she got a new one. He tried locking her out of the condo. She got her own key. He would ignore her while he was at work. So she would call the front desk. Like, it seemed like there were so many things that she was doing that he had absolutely no control over. So I definitely can see how this took a huge toll on Ryan and just made him so exhausted that he just said, you know what? I guess I'm just gonna deal with her because it's easier than trying to break up with her. So this all just seems like a horrible, horrible mix of a guy who just wants to do his own thing, who doesn't want to be with her anymore, and a girl who just cannot let go. I just think that she was so desperate for his attention, obviously that was very clear, and that once he tried to pull away for good and was officially done with her, so done that he was going on a date with another girl, she just snapped. And I think that it was a situation where she thought, if I can't have him, 
then no one can. That's pretty much what I think happened. I think, again, she was very jealous and possessive and just didn't want him to be with anyone else if she couldn't be with him herself. I personally don't think that there's any real evidence that he was physically abusive. I think that it did get to a point where he had to pick her up and throw her out of her apartment, and that's not right if he did it violently, but I do understand why it happened. Obviously, being thrown on the ground is not okay. Obviously, having someone shove you is not okay but if he had to physically lift her up and throw her out of his apartment because she just would not leave, I can see how that would happen. Again, that doesn't make it right. He probably should have called police or something like that, but I think that was really the only physical abuse that happened, and I think that's what the evidence shows. I don't think that he was physically abusive towards her in any other way, and I also do believe that he probably said some pretty demeaning things to her, but I also think that could have been his way of trying to be like, look, I'm not a good guy, break up with me, I'm mean to you, I say all these awful things to you, why are you still with me? I kind of think that is probably where this came from. Again, not that it makes it okay, but I do think that that's why he would have said those things if he did. At the end of the day, after hearing all of the evidence and hearing everything that was done, I don't think that Shayna has any remorse. I think that she truly believes that he deserved this. I truly think that in her head, she thinks, well, he treated me badly. He did all of these things to me, so he deserves to be hurt. He deserves to be shot, and he deserves to die. Because to this day, she hasn't shown any remorse, as far as I know, and I don't think she feels bad. I genuinely don't think that there's anything that Ryan could have done to prevent Shayna from being in his life. I think once Shayna decided that Shayna wanted to be in his life, Shayna is going to get what she wants, even if that means she's going to go to his house and not leave. Even if that means she's going to get a new number to text him. Even if that means that she's going to get her own key to his apartment. At the end of the day, the world lost a very, very intelligent and motivated young man. He was very well on his way to making something of himself and making his impact on this world and doing something great with his life. My heart goes out to Ryan's family and everyone else who loved him. I can't even imagine how much of a tragedy this is, especially knowing how bad this relationship was for him. No one could have predicted that this would be the outcome. But again, my heart absolutely goes out to him and his family. So that is pretty much all I have for today's case and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that Ryan was physically abusive and that this was in self-defense? Or do you think that Shayna was just obsessed with Ryan and decided that if she couldn't have him, then no one could? Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshiningcases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover here on my channel comes directly from that email, so make sure you go ahead and send those suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!